Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the State Theater for this wonderful venue. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about my experience with the State Bar so that you understand how I got involved in this reform activity. Every time a case goes to court, the justice system also goes on trial. We have this idea in our jurisprudence that no matter how sleazy, no matter how terrible we think somebody is, once they go into the court system, they are supposed to have a fair chance at defending themselves, a fair hearing, and to have the case decided by a neutral arbitrator, a neutral decider of fact. The reason for that is every now and again, no, no matter how certain we are that somebody is guilty or they did this or didn't do that, every now and again, once you hear their side and see their evidence, you go, you know, Actually, there is something I didn't see here. There is something different about this than what I originally thought. And that's why we have the system that we have, and that's why it's so important to maintain that. I was a very busy family law attorney here in Modesto. I'd been practicing for 15 years with no disciplinary actions. And in early 2005, the State Bar Investigator's Office contacted me and said that there were two bar complaints against me. One was from a client. Uh, he was the husband in a very long, very messy divorce case. And his primary complaint in the beginning was simply that he felt that I'd overcharged him. My fee for his total case after, geez, four years of litigation and going through all of this uh, was roughly around 20,000, just a little over for the total case. And he thought that was too high. One of the reasons why I thought it was too high was because his ex-wife was being represented by another lawyer in town who also got into a romantic relationship with her and he charged her less money and therefore he, my client thought I should have charged him less money. And I told my client, you know, I'm not gonna get into a romantic relationship with you, I'm sorry. Uh, this is my, my fee. We did actually wind up going to an independent fee arbitration here in Modesto with th three people on the panel. They did find fully in my favor that I had actually earned all that money. But anyway, that precipitated a whole chain of events with him going to the state bar. Uh, the second complaint was from the ex-wife of a client. Uh, I also represented that hu the husband in that case. It's a whole different case. I represented the husband, but the ex-wife complained. She said that I was supposed to have paid her out of the trust funds that I was handling. I was supposed to have paid her something like thirteen to fourteen thousand dollars, even though the court order said I was only supposed to pay ten or eleven. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit hazy on the details, but those figures are very close, which I did in fact then pay to her lawyer. Now, in the first case, and in both of these cases, I was handling trust funds. This was back between about 2000, 2005, when the economy was still really good, uh, especially here in Modesto. If a person owned a house, they pretty much had equity in that house. If they got divorced and sold it, there's almost inevitably equity then to be divided uh, between the parties. So lawyers here, especially in a busy practice like mine, we would typically be handling a lot of trust funds. And um, let me explain to you, though, what the, how the trust funds work. The State Bar has set up a program called Interest on Lawyer Trust Accounts. It's called an IOLTA account. It's placed into a, an account at a bank, and then the interest is paid to the State Bar for their uh, program to help uh, indigent people get legal services. I mean, so it's a fine program. I have nothing against it. And those accounts, if you read the state bar manuals on, on all of this, those accounts are supposed to be used for money that's sort of quick in and quick out, or that are very small, so it's not worth opening up a separate uh, bank account for it. The most common use of the state bar or IOLTA account is uh, with personal injury attorneys, uh, where they bring in the settlement from the insurance company, and then they quickly write out the checks to the medical providers and to the client, 
and then whatever fees they earn, then they write the, that check to themselves. So it's kind of quick in, quick out. Uh, now, the purpose of a non-IOLTA account or non-state bar account is simply that if a case is going to drag on for a long time, especially in divorce cases, then what's going to ha happen is that the interest should then be paid to the clients or to the parties in the case rather than to the state bar. And this is what uh, the courts often ordered in family law cases, that uh, when the money is received, it's supposed to go into a non-state bar account. Okay, so the trust funds from the first case, from the husband that I was representing, that went into a non-IOLTA account set up in his name at a bank that used to be here before they went belly up during the uh, great financial meltdown. Um, so that money went into a, in a separate non-IOLTA account just set up in their name. Meanwhile, on the second case, uh, the money went into the state bar trust account simply because we thought that that case was going to settle quickly. <clears throat> it didn't. And um, anyway, that's that story. So what happened, though, is that a busy family law attorney such as myself, and it was very common uh, back then, was that we would handle multiple non-IOLTA accounts. We'd have our main state bar trust account for that quick in, quick out money. But then very often we were in the middle of these messy divorces, so we would set up individual accounts for each individual client. So it's very common for a family law attorney such as myself to have multiple non-IOLTA accounts open at the same time. During the time period in question, uh, at one point I was up to as many as six uh, trust accounts that I was a signatory to, but there were four main accounts at that time. The state bar account, the first client that I told you about, and then there were, another, there were two other accounts that I had set up for another client uh, with, with funds in them. I ex that's what I explained to the state bar when they first contacted me because they saw that the balances in the accounts that I had uh, for the two clients, both the state bar and the uh, first client, they could see that the balances had dropped below what it should have been at that time. So to them it was like, Oh, okay, this looks like a regular garden variety misappropriation case. And that's how they started to treat it. I explained, no, uh, there were other accounts, other trust accounts. That's where I was keeping most of the money, simply because those were safer accounts. What a lot of people don't know is that when you set up a non-IOLTA account, the lawyer, at least at that time, and I don't think it's changed since then, the lawyer at that time would have to use their own social security number or their own tax ID number. So if the lawyer had a personal creditor who could uh, extract a lien or go in with a uh, levy, uh, they could go in and levy the client's money because it was, had to be set up under the name of the lawyer or the law firm. This was a real danger. And so I explained to them that's why I prefer to use these other two accounts that I had simply because I did not have that problem. They were in jurisdictions where I did not have that issue. There was no chance of a levy, which in fact didn't happen to those accounts, but it did happen to eventually to that account that I'm telling you about, that first account. There actually was a levy aimed at that, aimed at me, because I was having a dispute with the California EDD, the, edu uh, the Department of um, Employment Development. And also I was concerned about the, uh, even the IOLTA account uh, because uh, I had so much trust funds going through there all the time from all these different clients that there were copies of checks from those accounts scattered throughout all of these files throughout the office. And one day this police officer had come in to the office. Uh, <laughs> he had actually been out dumpster diving in the back because there were all of these um, uh, firms in the building. It was a large three-story office building in Modesto. Uh, with uh, some, uh, I think it was New York Life, and uh, I was downstairs. So they were going through just to make sure that nothing was getting into the uh, garbage that could be used for identity theft. So anyway, this um, police officer came in, and uh, he said, you know, we found a couple of things from your office 
that uh, apparently had escaped the shredder. Uh, sometimes I would have to hire temps or whatever. We had a shredder. Every now and again, something would, would escape that. So I was kind of worried uh, even about having an, a, uh, too much money in the IOLTA because of that danger. Uh, the office was accessed by the landlord, by the cleaning people every day. Every now and again, you have temps coming through. Uh, meanwhile, I, uh, the records for the other accounts were not scattered like that. So whenever possible, I tried to keep the money in those other two accounts. And it worked. Uh, the bottom line is everybody got their money on time. Uh, everything worked out fine in terms of all the clients getting their trust funds. Uh, it's been that way ever since I start, first started practicing law. Okay, so what happened was uh, I explained all of this. I didn't hear back from the state bar for about a year. All of a sudden, uh, they wanted to uh, subpoena the records from the state bar trust account. And the, the clients uh, that uh, had money that went through there, none of them had waived the attorney-client privilege. It's so very important for you to understand, too, that the financial information of a client is constitutionally protected. It's, it's, there's a privacy protection connected to it. A lawyer is not allowed to reveal that information, even to the state bar. If the state bar just comes in and says, hey, I want to know all your financial transactions you did for this particular client somewhere, you are not allowed to give that information to the state bar unless that client has complained to the state bar or unless the client has specifically waived the attorney-client privilege, as well as some additional very strong secrecy protections that are built into the California Business and Professions Code. Okay, so I had some concerned clients. Uh, they, got, they got their own lawyer to go to the state bar court and ask that the subpoena be quashed or that there be some other protective orders. During the, this early investigation stage, now the state bar does not reveal or make public uh, any of these records. It is confidential at that stage. However, if they decide later to file disciplinary charges, those records, any records that they collect, can be made public. And so uh, my clients were informed of this. None of them wanted to waive the attorney-client privilege, except for, you know, of course, that first client who had complained. He did it automatically by having complained. But all the rest of them uh, said no. So several of them got together, got their own lawyer, went to the state bar court, and asked for the uh, protective orders so that if later on any charges would be filed against me, they were guaranteed that their financial transactions that I performed for them would never be made public. The state bar judge denied their motion. And the motion included the other two major uh, trust accounts that I was handling that were outside of County Bank. Uh, County Bank, by the way, is where I had the two uh, trust accounts uh, that I'm talking about here. The, um, I, I should say the first two of the client that complained and of that other case. Uh, the, the IOLTA account was also at County Bank. Uh, these other ones were not at County Bank. Okay, so, so the, the judge just flatly denied any protective orders. Now, the, the state bar, yeah, they're entitled to receive the records from the IOLTA accounts because technically it's a, an account maintained by the state bar. Um, so that was okay, but my clients were very upset that there was no protection uh, for them later that all everything that had gone through the, uh, that IOLTA account could then be maybe disclosed publicly. Okay, so anyway, we, we went through that skirmish. Another year and a half passed, almost. I heard nothing from the state bar. And uh, finally, after about a year and a half, uh, they wanted to subpoena all my personal bank records from my personal accounts. They wanted to know where I had the accounts and, and they wanted to get those records. So uh, I went back to State Bar Court and I said, no, this is an overreach. They don't need these. They don't know, need to know every supermarket that I shopped at and so forth. And I, I'm gonna give credit here now to the State Bar Judge, uh, uh, Judge Armanderas in San Francisco. She denied their motion for these other uh, accounts for my personal accounts. She agreed that it was an overreach. 
the first judge that had uh, denied my client's motion for the protective orders was Judge McElroy, who later on I thought did a good job in my case. But um, anyway, that first decision of hers didn't help me. But anyway, Judge, judge Armandaris did that. So I thought, well, you know, these judges, I think they're trying to be pretty fair, at least the two here in San Francisco. Anyway, uh, so almost four years had passed. And finally, they decided they're going to file disciplinary charges against me. And the way they wrote it up was they made it sound like I had stolen the client's money, uh, that I had lied to people about having the money, uh, that I'd done all of these just horribly terrible things. And I was just shocked when I read this because, first of all, they had put a very low priority on my case. By the time they filed the disciplinary charges, all the trust funds had been paid, they'd all been paid on time. Uh, the state bar investigators and the prosecutor's office, they could see that everybody had gotten paid. And that's why I believe they put such a low priority uh, on actually filing the charges. I was not high on their list. Now they had a backlog problem too, uh, which they occasionally fight, but um, you could tell that they were not that concerned about me. But then the way they wrote up the uh, disciplinary charges, it sounded like, man, I was just like the, the worst lawyer in the world. Okay, so um, before uh, disciplinary charges are formally filed, there's an opportunity to do what's called an early neutral evaluation conference. And this is like a settlement conference. It's designed to maybe head off the f formal filing of disciplinary charges and to settle on something. Now, what had happened is that uh, I, I did not behave perfectly now in regard to the trust funds, and I'm going to be candid with you here, because in 2005, after I had first gotten the uh, notices of the complaints, I took the State Bar Trust Accounting School just to see, you know, had I handled the trust funds correctly. Of course, I should have known how to, uh, know it, considering how much money I was handling. But uh, I, as I told the State Bar, I had the, the accounts, the other two accounts were outside of California. And there's a rule that says you cannot keep client funds outside a bank that's in California unless either A, you have the client's permission, or B, there's a natural nexus between the client's activities and the out of state uh, venue or jurisdiction. Now there was for the two clients, who had, or for the clients who had set up those original out-of-state accounts, there was a, a connection for them. But there wasn't a connection for the clients who were in California. This is a rule that I didn't know about. In fact, I talked to a lot of lawyers, uh, well, I should say several lawyers, and asked them, did you know about this rule? And 201, they said, no, I didn't know about that. It's very interesting. I'll keep that in mind in the future. But yeah, I'm not trying to make an excuse. For a lawyer who'd been practicing already 15 years, I really should have known. And also, there's a rule that when a, uh, an attorney earns a fee from a client that's con that, that they're supposed to take out of the proceeds that they receive, like a personal injury lawyer, or in a divorce case like mine, uh, where you agree to not require your client pay right away for the services, but then you get to take it out of their share of the trust proceeds later. Um, lawyers are required at that point, once they earn those fees, they have to write checks to themselves uh, and deposit those checks for those fees into their business account or personal account. If the lawyer leaves the money in the trust account after they've earned them and after they're supposed to be paid, the lawyer is actually then guilty of commingling, meaning that they mix their personal funds with client trust funds, which lawyers are not allowed to do. Um, however, you, the lawyer is not supposed to write a check to, let's say, one of the lawyer's personal creditors out of the trust account, even if they earn the money as a fee. So let's say a lawyer has earned $1,000 that's sitting in a trust account and they are now required to pay themselves that $1,000. 
they are not allowed to write a thousand dollar check, let's say, to somebody else they owe a thousand dollars to. They're supposed to only write it to themselves and then, uh, then they can spend the money and pay whoever they need to pay. Again, that's another rule that I should have known, I didn't. So there were a couple of points there where I had earned fees from clients, but uh, I had gone ahead and written checks directly to personal uh, creditors or for personal stuff, but not, it didn't happen that often. Um, so I thought, okay, I, I, I see here, I did do a couple of things wrong as I told the state bar. And uh, I'll just wait to see what happens. I'm sure I, I would go ahead and accept some discipline for having done that. We reached a settlement now at the early neutral evaluation conference. I said, okay, they wanted a two year suspension. I said, all right, I'll take the two years, but please change this write up. The way you've written it up, the way you've written up this thing is that anybody reading it is not going to know that I had made all the trust payments on time, uh, that all the trust payments had been made. It was written up as though I had just pocketed and run off with all this client money, leaving the person to read this thing to wonder you know, what happened to the client's money. Did, did they ever get their money back? So uh, we prepared a, a, a new write-up, which is, was the agreement that we had that yeah, I would take the two years, they would accept a more accurate write-up so people reading it would understand. The reason I was so concerned about the write-up was because it gets posted on the internet. Uh, <laughs> I have some real issues with that. But anyway, uh, I knew it was going to get posted on the internet. People are going to read this about me, so of course I wanted it to be accurate. So we sent back the uh, new write-up for the prosecutor to approve, and they changed prosecutors all of a sudden. All of a sudden, I was assigned to a prosecutor named Maria Oropesa, who was in the San Francisco prosecutor's office. And she says, no, I'm not going to agree to these changes. It's written up just fine the way it is. I don't care about your settlement that you had with Judge Armendariz. Uh, I don't agree with it. And now I want a three-year uh, three suspension with uh, this write-up exactly the way it is. At the same time, I was also in the process of moving to LA because so I was get, I'd shut down my law practice in anticipation of a suspension. And I wanted to go ahead and go to LA to uh, seek my uh, fame and fortune there. Um, so we moved the case to uh, Los Angeles, to, uh, this play, uh, to the state bar court there. I had already started the alternative discipline program, and it's a good program, by the way. Uh, the part that I liked about it was the fact that uh, they had these uh, group sessions, I forget if it was every week or every couple of weeks, with a therapist. And it was really kind of nice just to sit down with these other lawyers, and they'd all gotten into their own little bit of trouble uh, with the state bar, and they were going through this program. The alternative discipline program allows the um, discipline to be reduced or even eliminated if it had been caused by either uh, substance abuse or by mental health issues. And my mental health issue was the difficulty in recovering from the deaths of these two loved ones, um, especially my, my significant other, and just the long time it took me to get over that. Normally I bounce back quickly from things, I just wasn't recovering from that very quickly at all. Uh, but that's normal when you lose somebody very, very close to you, like a family member. It's, it's apparently very common, it takes a long time. But anyway, it was, it was nice to just be able to sit there and, and talk to these lawyers to kind of lay it all out in a confidential setting. And um, I thought, well, I think I'm going to go ahead and do this. My first hearing with uh, Richard Hahn, uh, and my only hearing with Richard Hahn, was to just see where we're at on the case. We arrived in court, and then uh, Judge Hahn says to me, Okay, well, you need to agree to the facts of the case. If you want to continue with the alternative discipline program, there's a rule that says you have to agree to what the facts of the case are. What did you do wrong? 
And this is a stipulation that you have to sign with the prosecutor. <coughs> so I, this meant that I would have to try to get Maria Oropesa to change the um, statement of facts if I wanted to continue with the alternative discipline program, which I did. So I sat there in the courtroom and Judge Hahn said, okay, Mr. Dahlin, I need your decision right now. Um, are you gonna sign it the way it is, which is what you have to do, or you're gonna have to go the litigation route, and if you go the litigation route, you basically give up your ability to go on the alternative discipline program. I told Judge Hahn, you know, I, the, the trouble with signing this is just so outrageous, it doesn't tell the, the full story, it makes it sound like I was just somebody who ran off with client money, and he said, well, okay, so decide right now, which is it going to be? And I decided, you know, I, I just cannot live with that stipulation uh, the way it is. So I said, okay, I guess I just have to go the litigation route then. The case was then assigned to Judge Donald Miles in Los Angeles. And again, Maria Orpesa from San Francisco remained on the case as the prosecutor. Uh, Judge Miles then sent it to a um, settlement conference with Judge Platel, the other uh, judge in the State Bar Court there in LA, <coughs> for a settlement conference. Uh, I went in there, it was a rainy day, uh, the local rules of the State Bar Court require that both parties be physically present at a settlement conference. There are very good reasons why this is a very common requirement in any court. Uh, it helps to have the people physically there. She didn't show up. She said it was raining, which it was. It was raining hard that day. She said she couldn't get her flight to L.A. because of the rain. So she peered by telephone, and right away I knew, you know, this isn't going to really work. Uh, but anyway, uh, so Judge Patel came out there into the courtroom. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, he said, okay, Mr. Darlene, this three years that she's offering you is a gift. You need to sign this and take this deal. You know, uh, the things that you did were so terrible. And I said to Judge Hunwell, yeah, but wait a minute. The way it got written up was, of course, it sounds terrible because they're not really making it clear uh, that the trust payments had all been made on time. And in fact, the, the write-up, <clears throat> ever since the notice of disciplinary charges, the write-ups that the prosecutor kept preparing always mentioned the fact that I had other accounts. <clears throat> the complaint was that I had not left the money in these two original accounts. That was the basis of the misappropriation charge, but then they would keep stating in their written pleadings and the notes of disciplinary charges and later that there were other accounts from which I had made many of the trust payments. And I said, exactly, that's the whole point. That's exactly what I've been trying to say the problem is the state bar would not say what those other accounts were. And I had, uh, throughout this whole process, I said, I'd like to show you the bank statements from these other two accounts. I'd like to show you how the money traveled for all my other clients so you can understand why, first of all, why if I had no money at County Bank, why I was still able to pay all these large sums for other clients. It's because those large sums I was holding in these other two accounts. They recognized all of these payments. They said that I had other accounts, but they refused to say what those other accounts were, or what kind of accounts they were. And I said, these are trust accounts. The trouble is these were non-IOLTA accounts, and um, they were, had been set up under the name of the uh, clients that I had originally set them up for who would not waive the attorney-client uh, privilege. And uh, by the time they filed the disciplinary charges, of course, now anything could be made public. My clients said, no, you cannot give these bank statements to the prosecutor's office unless the state bar court orders a seal. A seal is a process by which certain records can be kept confidential and never made public. It's called Rule 5.12. It's a whole process in which um, lawyers in exactly the situation that I was in, namely that in order to defend themselves, 
they will need to uh, reveal information about non-complaining innocent clients who have no complaint against the lawyer who want their privacy protected. Excuse me, they want their privacy protected, uh, but, they, uh, but they don't want everything uh, made public. So I didn't think this was going to be a big deal, and it turned out to be a big deal, because during the investigation phase, I said, hey, look, uh, just uh, agree to the seal, and uh, I can give you all the bank statements from these other uh, banks. I can give you a lot of other records connected to those cases. And I can show you that I had these accounts and what kind of accounts these were. Uh, the response had always been, no, it's not the policy of the State Bar Prosecutor's Office to agree to seals because it's a public policy to have all these proceedings wide open to the public. And I try to explain, first of all, A, you're putting me into a catch-22 situation, and you know you're doing it. You know that it's a constitutionally protected right uh, to uh, assert financial privacy. It's a constitutional right. I can't just give you these things, especially now that we, especially after the disciplinary charges were filed and there was no seal. You know I can't do that. So why don't you just agree with me on a seal? We can get the judge to sign it, and I can give you everything. And I said, no, 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 we we, we won't do that. Getting back to Judge Platel uh, in, this, in the uh, conference room there, <clears throat> he said, uh, I, I said to him, look, just, I'll take the three years. All I want is for Maria Oropesa to change the wording so that people understand who read this that they got, all the trust funds got paid out. And it would be nice if they would also mention at least my claim that these other uh, accounts were trust accounts so that people would understand when they read it uh, what had really happened. Judge Patel says, nope, I'm not going to get involved in that discussion with Ms. Oropesa. Now, she was on teleconference from San Francisco. And Judge Patel said to me, you know, I'm not going to get involved in that conversation. If you want to uh, talk to Ms. Oropesa on the phone, I'll let you use the courtroom phone to talk to her and try to work that out, try to work out the wording. In the meantime, Judge Patel said, I'm going to go back in my chambers and I'm just going to start working on other cases while you either hash this out with Ms. Oropesa and also you need to read the new thing that she had prepared, the new stipulation of facts, because she had not sent me a copy in advance. She had made a couple of changes, uh, pretty minor, which I had not had a chance to read. So he, Judge Platel gave me his copy that he had received, and he just went and left me alone in the courtroom. And uh, so I sat there. Now, by this time, I had learned about this thing called cost assessments. Cost assessments are the fees that the state bar charges you at each level of the case. The further you take a case into the state bar court system, the more you pay the state bar. These are set fees for each stage. We were at the pretrial stage. If I did not settle and sign this uh, confession, basically, it's, uh, they call it a stipulation, but basically it's a confession of wrongdoing. I would have to, it would then go to trial, and then the, fee, the cost assessments would climb dramatically at that point, as soon as you hit the trial stage. So it's either you sign this, or you're going to owe the state bar a lot of money. And you have to pay this if there's any kind of public discipline. Even if you do a lot better at trial uh, than what this prosecutor is offering you, even if you get the wording that I wanted closer to what I thought was more accurate, even if I got those things by going to trial, I would have to pay the state bar its fee to conduct that trial for me. Because, it's, because I knew there'd be some public discipline, I was expecting it, and uh, because of those other things I told you about earlier. And then I had also become aware that there was a, that there's another rule that says that the, uh, the California Supreme Court, which is ultimately over discipline, 
Uh, the state bar is called the administrative arm of the California Supreme Court. Ultimately, the California Supreme Court is the one that monitors and decides discipline. Um, there is a rule that says that they could assess additional penalties against a lawyer uh, of up to $5,000 per charge for a maximum of $50,000. I was looking at a potential a potential of $80,000 that I might have to pay the state bar if I took this to trial. Now, this California Supreme Court does not often impose those additional penalties. They were not mentioned by the prosecutor trying to, as an inducement to get me to sign, but they did mention the cost assessments. Uh, but you never know if you're going to be the unlucky attorney uh, at the time that the California Supreme Court suddenly decides, yeah, we're going to start getting tough, we're going to start imposing these penalties now more often. Furthermore, these cost assessments are non-dischargeable in bankruptcy. Uh, there's a case about that, and the, you cannot uh, discharge them. So I was looking at potentially an $80,000 non-dischargeable debt to the state bar if I did not sign this thing that was put before me in front of uh, Judge Platel. And what happened was that I kind of looked at Judge Platel's conduct and how he really didn't seem to care. And I thought, boy, if this is sort of the attitude of the LA State Bar judges, and I'd also been a little bit upset with uh, Richard Hahn because when he wrote up his order after I'd been to his hearing, he just said that I chose not to do the ADP in his order, which assigned me to Judge Miles, as though I just didn't want to do it, um, which I thought was an unfair characterization. He didn't make any mention that uh, given the two options uh, of signing a false confession, essentially, or uh, going to trial, I just had to choose the litigation route just because I had some sense of integrity. Okay, so I, I, I had not a good feeling about the LA judges as a result of Richard Hahn and now Judge Platel. So I'll admit, in a moment of weakness, I just signed that thing. Uh, the only thing that Maria Oropesa had done was that she had put in a sentence at the very end saying that I had paid restitution. I think it, she used the word full restitution. I had f paid full restitution to the clients. And this was after this multi-page litany of how I had pocketed client money, how I'd lied to people, all of, how I was guilty of moral turpitude, all of these really frightful things. Uh, and then the, although she did mention that there were other accounts, but you, you easily lose that when you uh, read this document. So then I um, said, uh, okay, I'm just going to have to, I'm just going to sign this because she did put in the, the thing of a full restitution, which doesn't really tell you the story. It, that was her way of saying that I had made all of the trust payments. But they called it, but she wanted to call it full restitution, which also sounds like you just ran off and, and took a lot of client money and then you later paid them back. But I thought, okay, at least that's in there. I was just trying to justify this <laughs> decision, which I was very unhappy with, of signing this document. I was trying to justify it in my own mind, by saying at least there's that in there, and then if somebody comes to me later and says, hey, I read this horrible thing about you on the internet, um, I can at least say, okay, but there's that one sentence, let me explain what that full restitution meant, let me explain why they keep talking about these other accounts without mentioning what kind of accounts they were, and then I think you'll kind of get the picture. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll live with this and avoid a potential $80,000 hit. So I signed it, I walked out, not feeling really great about myself, but at least I thought the case was over. Judge uh, Platel had complimented me and said, okay, very good, you signed it, that's great, and Maria Pisa seemed very satisfied. Now, the stipulation that's reached at, a, at this stage of the settlement conference has to be approved by the assigned trial judge, which is now Judge Donald Miles. He had to approve this thing. We got back an order saying, I do not approve this stipulation. This matter has to go to trial. And in so many words, he says, 
because of what Darlene did, uh, this three-year suspension isn't enough punishment. Uh, he's got to be punished more. Basically, he needs to be disbarred. I called Maria after getting that. I said, okay, <laughs> look, Maria, you can see now that your write-up is not working. Judge Miles will not uh, agree to this because it sounds too alarming. Can, you, can we please take this sentence about um, full restitution and amplify it a little bit to say that the trust payments have been full and complete and timely during these cases? This wasn't, okay. He said, no, no, it's fine just the way it is. And uh, at this point, I actually was pretty fed up. I, th I thought, okay, I don't, I don't want to be a member of the state bar anymore. Uh, I had, by this time, I'd practiced 20 years. That's the goal that I'd kind of set for myself when I had become a lawyer, to practice for 20 years and then retire from law. I didn't want to retire in this method, but okay, so that's, I, I kind of saw that uh, fate had uh, taken my 20-year uh, wish and <laughs> was kind of kicking me out. I'm joking a little bit. I, I can look back and I hope see some of the humor in all of this. And uh, so I said to Maria, okay, I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to resign from the state bar. I'd like to do what's called a resignation with charges pending. Now, a resignation with charges pending, um, a new rule had just been adopted, which said that when you do that, you have to reach a factual stipulation with a prosecutor. And that rule had just come into effect two years, or I'm sorry, two months earlier in January of 2010. Prior to that, you did not have to sign anything. You just submitted your resignation and that was it. And there was nothing posted about you on the internet other than a notice on your bar page that you had resigned with charges pending and that was it. But they decided that wasn't enough that uh, just uh, Whoever passed this law decided that, hey, lawyers were getting away with something by not uh, having all of these dreadful facts, or at least their version of facts, posted on the internet in addition to resignations. Now, resignation with charges pending, uh, you can't reapply for readmission for at least five years, which is the same as a disbarment. When you're disbarred, you can apply for readmission after five years. Um, so the practical effect of a resignation with charges pending is the same. And when you resign with charges pending, uh, you have to go through a petition process. They can, they can uh, bring back that old case. They could say, well, we'd never fully resolved this case, but now we can go ahead and look at all of this again. And usually, of course, that works against the lawyer. When a lawyer ch resigns with charges pending, it's typically the end of that lawyer's legal career just like a disbarment. So I knew that this was the end of my legal career. I was okay with that. I had gotten really pretty fed up <laughs> with this whole thing. And I thought, you know, if, these, if this is the kind of system that's uh, operating, if this is what I'm gonna be under, it's time to go. And I noticed that clients were getting nastier and it was not against me, but just amongst themselves, the, the divorces, Divorce cases were just seemed to be getting uglier. Uh, so it, it was time to go. So I signed this resignation with charges pending. And Maria gives me the same, pretty much the same write up. Uh, and I sign it. Now, a resignation with charges pending, once it's signed by the prosecutor and by the uh, uh, lawyer, it doesn't get approved by the trial judge. Now it goes to the review department. These are the three judges who are above the trial judges. The, the state bar has five full-time trial judges, three in LA, two in San Francisco, and then it has a review department, which is the presiding judge, uh, in this case, Joanne Remke, who's full-time, and then two other judges who are uh, part-time so, uh, so essentially it goes to Joanne Remke. And then she has to approve uh, the resignation with charges pending before passing it on with a recommendation to the California Supreme Court. Ultimately, the Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court has to approve the resignation. 
but first it's reviewed by the uh, presiding judge of the state bar court. Okay, so, uh, Joanne Rumke came back and she said in a written order, she didn't approve it at first. She said, okay, after reading this, and I'm paraphrasing what she said, after she, uh, she said in so many words, after reading this stipulation, I don't understand what happened to the client's money. <laughs> okay. Um, by this time, my case had been going on for five years. Uh, gosh, maybe a little bit long. Yeah, about five years. She, she said in so many words, I don't understand what happened to the client's money. Did they get their money? Did, it, did, did either of these two clients make a claim against the uh, State Bar Restitution Fund against Dolly? And of course, no clients had ever made any claims against me uh, for the, in the Restitution Fund because throughout my 20-year legal career, everybody got their, their, their funds when they were supposed to. And uh, so she sent that back wanting an explanation. And I read that and I said, oh my God, this is exactly what I have been fighting five years to get Maria Oropesa and the earlier prosecutor to put into this factual write-up exactly the questions that Joanne Remke is now finally asking. I felt very vindicated. I thought, okay, maybe this five-year struggle is finally going to pay off because this presiding judge seems to get it. This is exactly what I had wanted to see happen. Now, when a resignation with charges pending goes to uh, this process, in, within the prosecutor's office, they change prosecutors. They had a prosecutor handle it, who later got fired, not because of my case, but I don't know what happened, but she later got fired. But anyway, she was the one who then um, was in charge of handling the resignation cases. I called her and I said, um, look, uh, this is what I've been fighting for. Judge Remke wants this information. This is exactly the information I've been wanting to put into this write-up all along. We could have settled this. Uh, five years earlier at the early neutral evaluation conference uh, if this had just been put in what Joanne Remke is now asking for. So can we now please put this into this stipulation, into this write-up, and make it really clear? And again, I expressed my concern that whatever the final write-up would be, it's going to get posted on the Internet. So I thought, great, we finally have this resolved. It, it cost me a resignation to get there. But the, the, the lawyer, the prosecutor, she said, well, I can't change anything in the write-up. Uh, it's still up to Maria Oropesa. <laughs> she was still, I guess, officially assigned to the case, but procedurally or administratively, this other lawyer is handling it, but Maria, I guess, was still somehow uh, in charge of the case in the prosecutor's office. Said, no, you're gonna have to go to Maria Oropesa. And I knew then it was just absolutely hopeless. So then I, I said, okay. My problem was that what Joanne Remke wanted <clears throat> was basically a supplemental pleading, a new write-up, <clears throat> not a new write-up, but I should say a supplemental write-up explaining uh, about what happened to the trust funds explaining how they had gotten paid and all of that, and basically explaining what these other accounts were that the prosecutor kept talking about. Uh, the, the lawyer on the other side, the prosecutor, didn't submit a very good write-up, but I was able to, a supplemental pleading. The problem with those supplemental pleadings, though, is they do not get posted on the Internet. Only that main stipulation gets posted on the Internet. So by submitting these supplemental declarations to Joanna Remke, she may be satisfied enough that she's going to now pass it on to the um, California Supreme Court. But when the California Supreme Court approves it, they're just going to uh, post, the state bar is going to post this original pleading on there. The supplemental pleadings aren't going to be there for people to see online. They'd have to actually go into the state bar's uh, clerk's office in Los Angeles to dig up the file to see, and they're not going to even know that there was a supplemental 
uh, pleading even submitted. At that point, I said, okay, I have just had enough. I felt very ashamed for having signed that. And yeah, the, the financials were, very, uh, ever, were still a very big concern to me. But I was, I was fed up. I thought, you know, I had really lost my integrity for having kowtowed to all of this, especially when I felt vindicated by Joanne Remke's um, so questions that came back to us. So I thought, okay, I'm just going to go ahead now and push to get this trial. Let's just go to trial. <laughs> Set it for a five-day trial in San Francisco. Meanwhile, uh, one of the uh, people who were involved in those other two trust accounts, uh, she was overseas. I had gone through a lot of hoops to arrange a deposition of her. Uh, she was willing to at least initially uh, help me out and give me a deposition with a lot of additional documentation that I could then present at the time of the trial. Uh, she couldn't make the trip for the trial to come to the United States, but she could at least uh, do that for me. So I, I felt kind of grateful, but then the problem arose again. She changed her mind because of the same thing. There's no seal. She did not want all of these records and everything made public, because it would have been public then. As we approached trial with Donald Miles, I filed a motion, a written motion for a seal under Rule 5.12, explaining I just got to have these uh, records sealed so I can defend myself when we get to trial. Maria Peza, of course, uh, submitted her opposition to my motion. The way that motions work in State Bar Court is there's rarely a hearing set. They're typically ruled on simply on the pleadings. So I was expecting to get a written ruling before trial as to whether or not I could get a, get a seal because that would make a difference as to how I presented my case and as to what I could present. I'd hoped that maybe if I got my seal order back from Judge Miles, I could have maybe at the last minute gotten her deposition, which would have helped me, but no deal. Nothing came back. I'd also submitted uh, prior to the trial a motion to set aside the stipulation. Now you say, well, why would you do that when the presiding judge, who is senior to Judge Miles, says, no, you can't set aside the stipulation. You're stuck with it, and that's going to be the statement of facts if you go to trial with Judge Miles. Why would you even waste everybody's time filing a new motion to set it aside? I did that because there's a procedural rule, is that the Orders of the hearing department, or I should, no, I'm sorry, the orders of the review department do not become final. I believe it was um, 30 days or 45 days, something like that. But because of the order saying that the uh, trial had to be expedited, we would actually be conducting the trial before Judge Remke's order saying that the stipulation couldn't be set aside before her order became final. Therefore, I argued that I can raise it here with a trial judge because that is not a final order. Okay, so we get to the first day of trial. Judge uh, Miles came to San Francisco. Uh, it was set for a five-day trial. On the first day of trial, the first morning of trial, I noticed that Maria Orpeza had not brought any witnesses. All of these witnesses that she said that she would want and the reason for setting it in San Francisco, um, uh, none of those uh, witnesses were there. She came in uh, only with the stipulation and the, the bank records uh, from County Bank, you know, the uh, IOLTA account and the one from the first client, that non-IOLTA account. That's all that she had. She, and she said, you know, Judge, um, we are relying on what the review department judge, on what Judge Remke said, 
that this is final and binding on Mr. Dahlin, and these are the facts that have to be considered by the trial judge, and you can't go beyond that. Now, Judge Miles said, no, Dahlin's right. The order's not final. And I thought, well, all right. Judge Miles is maybe doing okay here. He, he seemed to behave a little bit independently. So then uh, he said, okay, what I'm going to do, though, now he did something very unusual. He said, what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to take this stipulation into evidence right now and subject to Mr. Dahlin being able to make a motion to strike it. Now, I wondered, well, why would he have me do a motion to strike if I had already filed a motion to set it aside, a motion which I had reminded him of in my pre-trial statement that I needed a ruling on because I had come to trial with all of these bank statements and records and everything else that I wanted to show Judge Miles to show that these other two accounts that they, well, the other accounts that they kept referring to, they didn't say how many, but the accounts that they kept referring to in their statement and pleadings that these were actually trust accounts. Um, so I said, uh, I, and then I asked the judge, well, uh, am I supposed to make this motion orally right now? Ver do I make a verbal motion right now to strike, now that you've taken it into evidence? He said, no, I, I can't do it on the basis of a verbal motion. So that told, told us, okay, it had to be a written motion to strike. And basically, I had to file a second motion to get rid of that or set aside or strike that thing. He didn't do what's called shortening time when he told us this. He didn't say, okay, Mr. Darlene, um, you are entitled, and he said this on the record, it's you know, on a tape recording, uh, in fact, uh, in the documentary that I made, Scandal of the State Bar, in the bonus section, my story is told, and you can actually hear his words from the recording from the trial. He said, Mr. Darlene, you're entitled, I'm gonna give Mr. Darlene a full trial on the issue about whether or not he signed this voluntarily. If, if it was not signed voluntarily, uh, he, and he used the word if there was a gun to his head, um, then there might be grounds to set this aside. So Mr. Darlene's gonna get a full trial on this. Okay, so I thought, well, that's good. Um, so that, I, I appreciated Judge Moss for that, but I was puzzled by what, how he was doing it. You know, why not just do it right away? Why not just, it would take probably a day to do that trial and talk about the allegorical gun to my head was this $80,000 penalty. Um, but uh, then we got to the issue of the seal. I said, well, Judge, I, need, I also need the seal that I asked for in previous uh, motions. And uh, the judge agreed with me that, yeah, that clients are entitled to this kind of protection if they have not complained about the lawyer and they have not waived the attorney-client privilege. The judge, Miles, agreed with me on my position that they were entitled to confidentiality protection. Now, Maria Oropesa said something very unusual at trial, then she says, well, it's just the practice of the prosecutor's office just to submit all of these records. We were talking now about the trust, the IOLTA County Bank trust account records, because there were copies of the canceled checks. Many of those canceled checks had the names of other clients on them, because a lot of different clients' money went through that IOLTA account. So he says, okay, Maria, uh, Ms. Oropesa, Judge Ma said to her, I would like you to come back uh, tomorrow with some research on this question as to whether I can uh, really re uh, make public these uh, documents from the uh, IOLTA account, which of course affected then my motion for the other pleadings. Okay, so then we kind of came back the next morning, the, the, the second and last day of trial. And then Maria Orpesa said, well, you know, okay, I did uh, my research and now it's the practice, she said, she kind of changed the story. Now it's the practice of the State Bar Prosecutor's Office to agree to a seal. Uh, again, we were talking about the uh, IOLTA account uh, checks. And I thought, hallelujah, 
<laughs> it took me, how, how long had I been fighting with the um, prosecutor's office over this? How long had I been pointing out the catch-22 situation that they were putting me into uh, by not having agreed to it? So here we are on the very uh, last day of this trial, and I had already lost a valuable witness the one that I was going to depose anyway maybe I could get her again because if the judge were also to later set aside that stipulation that would mean that the whole thing would have had to go to a full trial anyway so maybe there would have been another chance for me to get that uh, deposition and now with her agreeing with a seal I was sitting there at that moment in, in Judge Miles's courtroom thinking hallelujah wow did I go through a, a living hell to get here and you know, part of the problem of uh, that's the digression, but part of the problem in dealing with this case was I had to keep reliving the most horrible years of my life, the death of those two family members. It was, it was just a traumatic time for me, and I had to keep rethinking those years, keep reliving those years, because those are the exact years that were at issue here in this uh, state bar case. So I thought, finally, we're at it. Then Judge Miles opened his mouth and says, well, I am not going to grant the seal. He, he said that because, and it's on the record, you'll, he, you'll hear his voice if you watch the documentary. It's just administrative, administratively, it's just too much work. It's a hassle to do it. We're gonna have to seal it if it goes up on appeal. It's just a pain. He said nothing about that there's a public policy interest. In fact, he agreed with me in principle that the interest of client confidentiality is a stronger public interest. The attorney-client privilege is more important than the public's right to know every single detail that might happen in a discipline case. Where the two collide, the attorney-client privilege wins. And he agreed with me on that. But his solution, he said, well, what we're gonna do is we're simply going to exclude all evidence related to other clients. It simply cannot go into evidence by either one of you, meaning Ms. Oropesa or by me. It was good for the clients, and I was glad to see my clients protected, but I knew I was sunk because I had this whole, I, I had uh, one or two cartons just full of evidence and files, and, I knew that now I can't, I, I couldn't present anything to this judge about the other two accounts. And I thought, the judge must realize what he's doing to me. He must understand that he's closing me off from a defense. Because I'm not about to, I'd made the decision, I'm not going to weasel out of this, I am not going to betray my clients. I, f I feel that the attorney-client privilege, I believe that the constitutional right to financial privacy and all constitutional rights are important. We need to respect them. And especially now that I had Maria Oropesa's agreement, uh, at least as to those checks, um, why, why should I? And then I figured, well, maybe what happened was that Judge Miles um, saw that the evidence that Maria Orpesa had brought into evidence, I'm sorry, the evidence that she brought into the trial, none of it related to the other accounts that she kept mentioning in her pleadings. It didn't, it didn't say what kind of accounts they were, where they were, it just said that I had paid many of the trust uh, payments from other accounts other than the Tewitt County Bank. So I thought, okay, well, maybe Judge Miles is satisfied with my explanation. Maybe he feels he doesn't need it since it was, my statement was, was that these were two trust accounts, uh, non-IOLTA trust accounts. And maybe he was satisfied because Maria Arpeza had not brought in anything to contradict my statement. Maybe he feel then he didn't really need to know or to have that evidence. Uh, and then have to seal it all and make a big problem out of the sealing, all that procedural hassle. So I, I kind of gave Judge Miles the benefit of the doubt on that as we, we went along, expecting, you know, maybe he's going to give me, I hope, a, a fair hearing here and understand these things. 
Anyway, we finished the trial. And uh, we went off record. And then we did the usual chit-chat. And here you're just going to have to take my word for it. Uh, we just started chit-chatting about what we're going to do. And uh, Judge Mileson mentioned that, yeah, he had some other things planned for the rest of the week. I thought, well, wait a minute. We had been set for a five-day trial. We started on a Monday. Why would he have set other commitments for, like, later in that week? Because uh, we did, we, he, he basically had to keep it to two days in order to meet these other commitments. But then it made sense to me why he seemed to want to push off these other things. For example, the motion to strike, why he didn't want to make that ruling right away because we wouldn't have had time to do the trial that he had promised me on that, on whether or not I had signed it voluntarily, and then uh, if he ruled against me, then do the other trial. Now the other trial, even though the statement of facts is put in, there's another phase to a state bar trial called mitigation and aggravation. That's where uh, you, know, you have your basic statement of facts, but then even though you establish those, even with a stipulation, the lawyer can still put on evidence uh, and called in mitigation saying, okay, well, look, okay, yeah, even if these facts are found to be true by the court, there were mitigating circumstances. And that's really what the trial became. And so, of course, my mitigation evidence was going to be these other uh, trust accounts. Okay, so we ended the trial, and I went ahead then and filed my motion to strike in writing, sent it to the judge. Uh, Maria Orpesa filed her opposition, and uh, we just waited for the next thing from Judge Miles, who by this time, of course, had returned to L.A. Then he sent, I was expecting to get a uh, trial date for this trial that he had promised me. After I, we both submitted our motion in opposition, I was expecting, okay, we're going to do a trial on this now that he had promised me. Instead, he sent back his final decision on my case. And in that final decision, he said, no, uh, all of Darling's motions to strike and set aside, uh, I'm denying those because Darling had a chance to present his evidence on that and he failed to do so. <laughs> I mean, I must have, well, I didn't quite fall on the floor, but figuratively I, I, I did. And I thought to myself, well, wait a minute. I've never heard of doing a hearing or a trial on a motion that has not yet been submitted, on a motion that hasn't even been written. He specifically wanted a written motion to strike. I've never heard, in all my 20 years of law practice in the family courts, I've never heard of you doing a whole trial on a motion that you have not even written and that the other side has not had a chance to even respond to because those written pleadings sort of tell you what the trial is going to be about or the hearing. They set the parameters for the hearing. If the judge wanted to do something different, if he kind of wanted to reverse the order and say, okay, let's go ahead and let's hear all of your testimony, of course, he, he, he'd never, he, he should have said that. He never said that. He didn't say, Mr. Darlene, even though you're going to file this written motion and normally these are the rules and normally hearings are held later, I want you to now at this trial today to go ahead and present all of your evidence and testimony about that issue, about whether the signing of the stipulation was voluntary or not. He didn't say that. And when Maria Oropesa filed her opposition, she didn't make the argument that I had failed to present evidence. She apparently, at least for reading between the lines, thought the procedure was the same as I thought. We filed the motions, her opposition, he sets a trial date, and we have our little trial on that. Okay, so we, we had that issue. Now, he, he did include a finding that I wanted, that Maria Oropesa had refused to uh, put in there, that nobody was harmed. That was very, very important to me. Uh, you know, being loyal to your clients, doing your best for them has always been very, very high in my priority as a lawyer. I know I'm sounding a little self-serving saying this, but it's, it's really true. What really, really stung me about that whole write-up was the sense that I had hurt these clients, that I had run off with their money. 
And it was that sense that I had done harm that come, came out of Maria Rapaz's write-up uh, that I didn't like. And it was very important to me to have a no harm provision, which Maria Rapaz refused to put in there. Uh, but Judge Miles made a finding that the, none of my clients had been harmed. Okay, so I got that. He also made a finding, kind of buried a little bit grudgingly in a single sentence, that uh, I, I had made all the trust payments on time. But because he wouldn't set aside the stipulation, his findings were mostly just a cut and paste of that stipulation, the same wording you know, with a few of his own comments thrown in here and there. Judge Miles also made a statement saying that my testimony about the other accounts was uh, not convincing or persuasive. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, of course it wasn't persuasive. I couldn't give him the kind of evidence that judges want, that lawyers expect. And, and it was because he wouldn't grant me a seal that, a, that I, I couldn't present it to him. And, and I thought he surely must have realized that he had tied my hands. How can he say that I had not presented a uh, persuasive case on that? Plus, he copied and pasted all the language that said that I had other accounts. But he also left it blank and left it unstated what those other accounts were. So he, he, had, he acknowledged that all the trust payments had been made on time, that there was no harm to the clients, that other accounts existed. But when I said that those other accounts were trust accounts, he, he wouldn't believe me. And in the meantime, he wouldn't grant me that seal so that I could have shown him and persuaded him of that. Okay. I, by this time, uh, I thought, wow, these people are... This is, this is a seriously deficient justice system that the state bar is operating. This is not a, a healthy system. So I thought, okay, now we're going to go ahead and go to the review department. I was a little bit uh, worried because of the Joanne Remke's uh, conduct. She was part of this review department. But I knew that there were at least two other review department judges. So I figured between the three of them, at least one or two of the other judges could kind of lean on her and say, okay, look, here are the facts. Uh, we need to handle this a little bit differently. So I submitted my uh, petition to the review department. To And I mentioned all of these things that I've told you about today. But I also discovered, as I was preparing my petition to the review department, that Judge Miles had not signed a, a form that the state bar judges use when they want to approve a stipulation ending a case. It's, it's an approval form. Uh, the judges are required to make certain findings uh, that, uh, that it meets the interests of justice, that the, protect, uh, the public is served or protected. Uh, it's sort of like a stipulation in any court in, in California, certainly in the superior courts where I practice, where uh, if you reach a settlement in regard to, let's say, a property division or in regard to child custody, it doesn't take effect automatically when the parties sign it. It has to go to the judge because there's a public interest in the judge reviewing them to make sure that certain public policy needs are met. And it's stated very specifically in the state bar rules, there's no ambiguity at all, that these findings have to be made in state bar court. And so the judges have this form that they sign. I found out when I was preparing the petition, Judge Miles had not signed the form and attached it to that stipulation, this is the stipulation that I was trying to set aside. I thought, oh, okay, in the superior courts where I practiced, the failure of a judge to sign a stipulation almost always meant that the stipulation was not enforceable and it was not binding. And the, typically those the stipulations are, are tossed out. Okay, so I, I pointed this out in my written pleading to the review department, plus all the other things I told you about. Sydney's responsive petition was very inflammatory. And I was a little startled by it because she didn't address some of 
the key issues of what I thought were important for the uh, judges to know. And instead, I could tell she was appealing to their, um, uh, to their passions. Uh, there's an expression for it. She was trying to inflame the passions of the three uh, review judges. I could tell by her wording the way she uh, did this. That disturbed me because in the state bar, I'm sorry, in the superior courts, uh, judges usually don't like that. <coughs> they usually dislike people kind of going in there and trying to get them to make decisions based upon just inflamed passions. I had served uh, as a lawyer uh, on a number of occasions as a temporary judge in the Superior Court in Modesto in child support cases. And every now and again, you know, I'd get a, a person who would kind of go in there and tell me what a drunk, worthless idiot the other person was. And I really did not want to hear that because my mission was just to determine, you know, what was the custody arrangement, what are the child support guidelines, what are the factors that may be unique here, not why the marriage broke up. And the fact that the other person was a worthless drunk was something they needed to address, and probably did, with the mediator in the custody portion of it. By the time it got to me, custody was decided. And I, I noticed that most judges, we had some very good judges in Stanislaus County, in fact some of them are still there, and also in San Joaquin County and Merced County where I did a number of cases. Uh, I, I got a little spoiled, there were some good judges. And they, they just kind of wanted to, let's hear the facts. Um, so I was puzzled by this approach to inflame the passions of these three judges. But when we got back the decision I could tell that it worked on them. And I could kind of tell a little bit during the oral argument, you know, the, the, their very sour expressions when they were looking at me. It doesn't really come through in the recording so much. Well, it does in places. But it was a very inflamed decision that they came back with when they made their final decision. Um, they call it an opinion. When they came back with their decision, I could tell, like, wait a minute, these are the people who are a big part of the problem in the state bar court overall. This is a very small little court system. There are only five judges underneath these three review department judges. It's a small, tiny little world there. Uh, it's not like the overall court system of California where you have a couple of thousand of various types of judges and commissioners and hearing department people. This is a little world of eight judges. The impact of the three review department judges is gonna be very strong on the five hearing judges below them. And that's when I realized, and I should have realized earlier, that the three review department judges have set the tone for a lot of this stuff that I went through. Because what they wrote here was, first of all, that it didn't matter that I had these two other accounts. It didn't matter that I couldn't present my evidence about these two accounts. And this is what they actually wrote. They said that my arguing this meant that I didn't understand trust accounts. In essence, what they had ruled was that once you set client trust funds into a certain bank, into a certain account, they cannot be moved. They cannot be transferred. Now, I looked up all of this. There is no rule like that. It's comp, for example, let's say a, a lawyer sets up a trust account at Wells Fargo Bank, uh, and it's, whether it's a state bar or a non-state bar account, and they put, let's say, $10,000 in there. For whatever reason, they decide, okay, I want to switch banks. I think I want to have the money at Bank of America. There's no rule that says they can't do that. And there's also no rule that says that you can't combine the funds from different clients into 
a non-state bar account, as long as, and it's, it's a, there's a case law on that that I, I looked up, as long as the respective clients get their proportionate share of the interest, which of course they did. Nobody ever complained that I'd failed to pay any interest to anybody that they had earned on their non-state bar accounts. <laughs> Also three what I call the ridiculous charges that I had wanted uh, them to take out since the very beginning. Now I did sign the stipulation with those charges in there. Um, the first of those charges was the fact that um, I had lied to a um, Superior Court judge by filing a motion in the first case in the, uh, where I had the non-state bar account at County Bank where um, we had a debt that was still in dispute. It was a $6,000 debt to one of the party's creditors. Uh, these people, they were fighting like cats and dogs. I was getting sick of them, <laughs> to be honest with you. I guess I can say that now. My, my client had waived the attorney-client privilege by, by filing his complaint. I guess I can be a little bit candid now. I was so sick of this case. It had been dragging on for years. I just wanted to get these trust funds paid. I wanted to get them out of my hair and get these clients and also the, on the other side, um, the, uh, the, the wife uh, would call me directly, even though she was being represented by this lawyer that she was having a relationship with, a romantic relationship with. The lawyer gave her permission and gave her authorization to call me directly. So she would call me directly, and oh my God. And then she would call the Modesto Police Department saying, why, you know, or she did that one time, uh, saying, you know, you've, you've got to... Um, uh, he's not paying out the trust funds. And, and I pointed out to her, hey, look, your husband, you're not your husband, but your, your lawyer boyfriend, and he was a good lawyer, by the way. Let me, let me say this. I respected him as a lawyer. He's very good at negotiating debts. But there was a court order that said that he had to negotiate the debts. It was in the court order before I was allowed to pay them. So what the, the procedure became, he would negotiate the debt, and he did a good job. He was better at that than I was with, with their creditors. And I would immediately, uh, typically the, the creditors would want a cashier's check as a today only deal, and I would make sure, you know, the cashier's check, uh, I would run to the bank, make sure the cashier's check was issued and overnight it to the creditor. It all worked fine. <coughs> but he, he, he dilly-dallied there towards the end of the case. And I told her, you know, I, I can't pay these until uh, you're, uh, lawyer negotiates them, but as soon as he does, you can see that as soon as he does, I pay them immediately. So the prosecutors wrote this thing saying that when I wrote this motion to the family law judge, I had lied to the judge by saying that I had paid all the debts, excuse me, uh, I had paid all the debts to the uh, client's creditors, to the party's creditors. But then I pointed out, well, wait a minute, the very next sentence says, that I need a ruling on an unpaid debt. I couldn't have been saying to the judge that I had paid every single debt when I'm asking the judge for a ruling on an unpaid debt because quite frankly, I'm getting sick of these people and I wanna get rid of these debts. And there were still some unpaid debts because the other lawyer had not negotiated them. And I would, I would call him, I would write him, bugging him to please negotiate these things because my client was also getting frustrated with uh, the delays and getting this case resolved, and I sure wanted it done. And I'd also pointed out to Maria Oropesa, and, uh, and in this case, that I maintained, as I was supposed to, individual client trust ledgers, where you keep a ledger of the money in, it's on a separate ledger for each client, and every payment that's made in the date of the payment, plus you keep proof of payments, which would be photocopies of the check, or the, in my case, many, off, many cases, of cashier's checks, <coughs> which I provided to the other side. And I pointed out that uh, the trust account ledgers were totally accurate. I never wrote dates or payments on there that I hadn't yet made. And nobody had complained about that to the state bar. The clients hadn't complained about it. 
The judge hadn't complained about it. Nobody felt misled. This was just something that the prosecutor had dreamed up and come across and decided that, okay, this was just another example of my moral turpitude. And, but what the review department did when I pointed this out, the review department paraphrased what I had written. They didn't quote what I had written. They didn't say exactly what the wording was. They paraphrased it in a way to make it sound like I had written it the way that the prosecutors had accused me of. At, le at least the prosecutors had quoted the statement. At least they had done that. The review department wouldn't even do that. They twisted the wording a little bit in the way they paraphrased it to make it sound like I had done that, that lied to them. And that's the statement then that winds up on the internet. They had also um, said that uh, there's also a thing in there that I had um, written false statements on memos on three trust account checks from the State Bar trust account. I had written the name of the second client on there, the last name, on three consecutive checks in the memo. And these were checks that had nothing to do with that case or those clients. And I said, okay, yeah, that was, that was an error that I had made. Those checks were, all three were written in sequence when I was sitting writing checks. And they uh, were written several days before my father died. My, I had had a conversation with my father just a couple of days earlier. He sounded terrible. I was really distraught. In fact, I was so distraught that my secretary, Lori, could tell, and she said, look, Tor, uh, you just need to drive to Reno and go see your father. It was like a Tuesday, uh, uh, something like that. And I, I intended to go see him, but I was going to wait until Saturday because I felt I had too much to do. Lori said, no, you need to go. I can tell you, you just need to go. You don't have any more court hearings for the rest of the week. I'll reschedule all your appointments. We'll be able to catch up next week. Lori was great. She, she was a very, very good uh, secretary. I liked her in many ways. And, uh, but I made a decision not to, even though I was in a mental and emotional fog. And I pointed out to everybody that that's when I put those three memos, uh, or the three memos, that's when I put the names on those three consecutive checks. And I pointed out that, of course, in that case, I also kept a trust account ledger for that case. And those payments were never listed in that ledger. I never claimed in the case and pleadings to the clients, to the opposing party on any ledger that those uh, payments had anything to do with them. They didn't. But no, that was an example of how I was lying to people and uh, an example of my moral turpitude. Even though the review department made a mitigation finding that the grief and what I was going through because of these the, the, the deaths of these two family members was a factor in my case. <laughs> but they said it in very general ways. You can see it in the opinion. They, they did say that it was a, a factor and they gave me mitigation credit for that. But then when they were presented with an actual example of how that kind of grief and sorrow and fog actually affects you and causes you to make mistakes like, like that, they gave me no credit. No, no, that's, that's moral turpitude. Was, okay, I have the right to appeal this now to the California Supreme Court. I have the right now to go to the seven top judges, or they call them justices, of the entire legal system in California. These were seven of the best and brightest legal minds in the whole state. Uh, in their website and everywhere, they say how the California Supreme Court is committed and impassioned on the issue of justice. I thought, okay, they, they need to know. They're going to see here that there are some problems here in their state bar court. And I asked the state bar, I asked the Supreme Court to either dismiss the whole thing because now we were entering, we were close to the seventh year of this because by the time we got through the trial and did the review and all of that, we were now almost to seven years of all this whole process. And there is a case that's still, from what I know, a good law that says that if a lawyer cannot defend themselves, and this includes the criminal courts, the civil courts, and also it applies to the discipline court, 
If a lawyer cannot defend themselves without violating the attorney-client privilege of innocent clients, uninvolved clients, the charges are required to be dismissed against that lawyer. I didn't expect that by this point, because um, I started to realize that they, and I had cited this case uh, along the way to the review department and all that. Not so much with an expectation that I was really expecting them to dismiss it, even though it required it, because of Judge Miles' failure to uh, grant the seal. But I, 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 I argued and I said, okay, either dismiss it or would you please order this case back to trial? This is what I had asked the California Supreme Court to do. If you don't dismiss it, would you please at least send it back to trial with an order that the records have to be sealed so that I can present a defense and setting aside the uh, stipulation that I signed so that we just do a trial, let's just do the trial and not hold that against me. The California Supreme Court does not have to accept cases. In fact, they reject almost all cases that are sent to them. They only, they're only seven justices. And even though they're supposed to be keeping a sharp eye on the discipline system because it's their baby, so to speak, it's their, their administrative arm, uh, they use the same criteria in discipline cases that they do for all cases. They have the right to just refuse to hear them and it doesn't matter what that reason is. They don't have to state the reason. And so, uh, so I got back from the California Supreme Court, review denied. And it was signed by the new uh, Chief Justice Cantil Sakuye. I think I said that right. No explanation, but they don't have to give explanations. That was the end of my state bar case. And what I had learned along the way is that other lawyers were going through almost identical experiences with the state bar. I had talked to many lawyers by then. I'd talked to um, counsel for, you know, d defending lawyers in the state bar court. <laughs> And these types of activities have been going on in this little court system that the state bar operates. It's like a little cancer in our justice system. I hate to use that term because throughout my 20 years of law practice, I had come to really respect judges generally. I generally had had pretty good experiences with them, finding them generally fair, generally, generally willing to listen, yeah, of course, you, you always have situations where you disagree with a ruling now and again, especially if it's a case on your side and they rule against your client. <laughs> That's natural. But, but I came to basically really have a high regard for judges in general. <clears throat> and <clears throat> so this became really, really an eye-opener that this kind of little justice system can exist in a modern progressive state like California. And this inspired me then to make my documentary that I call Scandal of the State Bar, which I hope you'll uh, watch. And it also inspired me to start this thing called Californians for Attorney Regulation Reform. My biggest hurdle at this point in trying to affect this is just to make people understand that this stuff is real. This is really happening. And it's a serious problem, but it's so small and it's so concentrated in this little world of eight judges, kind of isolated both physically and administratively from all the other judges of California, that people don't understand that this is really happening. <laughs>
uh, under her while she was executive director had embezzled over $600,000 from state bar funds from rents that they had received uh, from tenants in their building in San Francisco, and maybe there were other funds involved too. And of course, that person went to jail, and, but uh, there, was, there was a big scandal that happened right under Judy Johnson's nose, uh, so she resigned. But then she was later appointed to be a superior court judge in Oakland, in Alameda County, where, as far as I know, she still sits today. I hope she's being a good judge. I don't know. But I was concerned because never in her time during the, uh, her involvement with the state bar did I see in studying the history of the state bar that she really tried to do anything to correct these kinds of problems that were going on. You see, what happens with the state bar executive director and the board of governors and all that, they are blind to all of this. It's hard to believe, but the state bar board of governors is composed of all part-time people. The majority are lawyers who are busy with their own law practice, the practices. They meet every now and again, a few times a year. They're assigned these little tasks. But they're fairly blind to what's really going on in the uh, discipline system. They just want to make sure everybody's being tough uh, because they think that, which is a situation that the state bar does need to be. They do need to be tough with bad uh, lawyers. But they think that this translates to this so-called toughness for everybody. And it doesn't matter if people get a little bit railroaded. They tend to disregard the stories that people like me tell. But they, they are part-timers. They don't really look into it. And the executive director at least didn't used to get too much involved. But uh, Judy Johnson should have known, considering her longtime involvement, about these uh, controversies about the state bar. So here she was, she, she resigned as a result of the scandal. She's now appointed to the um, Alameda County Court. There was another state bar prosecutor, the chief prosecutor, his name was James Towery. In fact, he was uh, involved with my case briefly. Uh, he uh, served as a temporary chief prosecutor after the one before him, uh, Scott Drexel, who had served for a very long time, uh, after Scott Drexel did not have his contract renewed by the bar. Uh, basically, he was fired. And this has also happened while my case was grinding through their system. So Jim, Jim Towery comes on. He resigned a year later as acting chief trial counsel, even though he was on track to become a permanent uh, employee and to be permanently employed in that position. He said that it was because he lived in San Jose, it was too far to drive back and forth to San Francisco every day to deal with it, and so he quit. However, a legal newspaper reported that, in fact, uh, James Towery was not going to be approved by the California State Senate for that position. Didn't say why. So here was this little bit more turbulence. But then what happened was that, uh, I'm not sure if he applied or if he was recommended, he just very recently was appointed to be a Superior Court judge now in Santa Clara County. Again, I hope he's doing a good job, but I noticed that while he was involved with the State Bar, and certainly during that year that he was involved uh, in the uh, prosecutor's office, and even in my case, I had a chance to talk to him on the phone in a conference call with him and Maria Rapeza uh, just before we had a uh, telephonic hearing with Judge Miles before the trial, I, sa I said, uh, Jim, what I'm really asking for here is would you please tell Maria that all I want is just a fair and accurate write-up and we can settle this. And um, he said, oh, okay, I'll talk to Maria about that. And then we hung up. Well, the next day Maria comes back. Nothing changed. And nothing had changed in the prosecutor's office in terms of their culture to try to deal with these types of issues. Uh, then the third person that I knew about was uh, a judge in Los Angeles County was Holly Fuji. Now Ms. Fuji was the state bar president, uh, I believe it was in 2009, and uh, of course she had been then on the Board of Governors for the three years prior to that. The president serves for one year after serving and being elected after serving for three years as a uh, member of the Board of Governors. Again, a these are all volunteer positions. And there was nothing during her time as president, there was nothing during 
her time on the Board of Governors, the four years that she was there, which overlapped my case, grinding through their system. Nothing came out of her that I could see to try to handle any of these problems that I ta I'm telling you about. And these are problems that have been going on for almost two decades. Uh, they really started, I think, substantially under the California Supreme Court under Ronald George. Um, and you'll see examples of that in the uh, documentary. Now, I understand that uh, uh, Chief Justice George was good in, in many ways. Other ways, he was not good, though, when it came to state bar matters. And unfortunately, his successor, uh, Judge uh, Kintil Koye, has not improved it. Uh, she hasn't taken any action to fix these problems either, it's, which kind of surprises me because she had been appointed by Governor Schwarzenegger. And in 2010, uh, in a, he, or maybe it was late 20, 2009, he had vetoed the bar dues bill, which would have shut down the state bar. And he was citing uh, problems with the state bar. He's basically accusing them of not really having the kind of integrity uh, that uh, the organization needed to have. And he was following a similar uh, veto of the dues bar, the bar dues bill that uh, Governor Pete Wilson had done prior to that, uh, more than a decade prior, that had actually shut down the bar for, I think, close to a year. At least the, the stalemate lasted a year, and the bar had to lay off 500 people at that time. So, and it's not just a Republican issue, by the way. Uh, you'll also see in the documentary that a couple of Democratic legislators also saw these problems. The problems that I'm telling you about have been seen, have been observed by many other people. And in fact, there have been attempts to try to fix them in the state legislature on occasion. Uh, Willie Brown introduced a measure to try to do that. And then... Um, uh, oh, there's another Democratic uh, senator. I'm sorry, his name escapes me at the moment. Uh, John Burton, uh, again a Democrat, who introduced legislation uh, to try to end some of these kinds of abuses that I'm telling you about. Um, and this was oh, well over a decade ago. But you can say, well, why, why does this continue? And this is what I couldn't understand. Why are so many people still going through this type of thing that I went through? and that you'll see in the documentary that many other people uh, have gone through. There, there are certain pressures that the bar is under. There are financial pressures. You also have the situation that the state bar judges, they are being employed by the prosecutor. The state bar is really a prosecuting body when it comes to discipline. That's, the, that's their mission, to get rid of the bad lawyers, to prosecute them, to get them out. And the state bar judges are employed by the state bar. They are paid by the state bar. This creates an automatic conflict of interest that we don't tolerate in our courts in California with the superior court judges. The superior court judges are hired differently than the prosecutors and the district attorneys are. There's, there's a degree of healthy separation between the two in terms of who their official employers are and uh, what fund uh, will, will pay them ultimately. But we don't have that with the state bar court. So the pressure to produce discipline numbers to get people out of the state bar and to disbar and suspend them is very strong because the state bar as a body has to produce and publish a discipline summary every year in which they list how many lawyers got suspended, how many got disbarred. This puts pressure on them to show that they are quote unquote doing their jobs by being able to show certain discipline numbers. If they don't, in any year they are threatened with a possible dues bill cut, uh, which the legislature can do, and they rattle that sword every now and again, hey, if you, the bar doesn't behave the way we want you to, or produce the way we think you should, we may not uh, approve a dues bill, and you guys are going to be out of business, or you're going to have to lay off some people. 
And uh, there's also a financial incentive with the um, funds, the uh, cost assessments that every time somebody is publicly disciplined at any level, they get to collect the same level of fees or the same rate of fees. Now, they, they say that that's not a big deal for them because the cost assessments, the total amount that's collected doesn't amount to that much in terms of their overall budget. But, you know, in a typical year, they could collect $600,000 worth of cost assessments. Okay, well, thanks very much for uh, listening. And uh, I hope you'll go to the website, calreform, C-A-L-R-E-F-O-R-M.org, and that you'll also watch the documentary Scandal of the State Bar.